Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us. Happy Earth Day, and welcome to our Ask the Expert event. Today, we're going to be learning about clean energy with Ben Hellerstein of Environment Massachusetts. I'm Craig Lamont, GBH News reporter and host for this afternoon's event. I just want to thank Earth Day Boston for partnering with us for this event. Uh, I also want to thank uh, everybody that's joined us today, including our leadership circle and our Ralph Lowell Society members. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for your support. Before we get started, I want to let you all know, unlike us, you're not going to be on video and we're not going to be able to hear or see you, but we do want to know all of your questions. If you have a question that you want our expert, Ben Hellerstein, to answer, uh, all you have to do is open the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and type in your question. Uh, as always, we'd love to know where you're tuning in from uh, when you submit that question, so please let us know. Um, and if you, if you see a question that you want to hear the answer to, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Uh, the questions that get the most thumbs up go to the top of the list, and we're going to make sure to, to get to the ones that most of you really want answered. So please uh, upvote the, people, the questions that you really want to see uh, and that you want Ben to answer. Um, if you want to turn on our closed captioning feature, all you have to do is click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, two transcription display options are going to pop up. We recommend you choose subtitle. Um, that'll bring up a captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also see full transcripts. That's a sidebar window that opens up where you can see what each speaker is saying. But uh, do bear in mind uh, the closed captioning might be a little bit de delayed. Um, but without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Ben Hellerstein. Uh, ben directs Environment Massachusetts efforts to promote clean air, clean water, clean energy, and open spaces here in Massachusetts. In 2016, he launched a campaign to repower Massachusetts with 100% renewable energy. Prior to assuming his current role, Ben led the organization's efforts to get Massachusetts to 20% renewable electricity by 2025. His areas of expertise lie in renewable energy and the impacts of fossil fuel pollution. And he's authored reports on clean energy policies at the local, state, and federal levels, which has gotten him media coverage all over the state, including many times by me. Uh, and I'm really grateful to, to have him with us today. Ben, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much, Craig. And yeah, it's really great yeah, to be talking to you today. I, I think it's a, it's a great way to honor Earth. First of all, happy Earth Day to you. Uh, thank you, Craig. Well, we like to say at Environment Massachusetts that every day is Earth Day, but uh, today is especially Earth Day. So appreciate it, especially Earth Day today, man. I'm, I'm glad we get to, uh, to, to celebrate it together. Um, you know, I, I just want to start generally uh, with a couple of questions here, but just real generally, you know, there's, there's been a lot of efforts in Massachusetts to get the state to transform to clean energy, right? Um, there's no shortage of plans out there to get us there, but it, it's going to take a while. It's it has been taking a while and will continue to take a while. And I just wanted to, to get your general feeling about the timeline of transitioning Massachusetts to clean energy, uh, to 100% clean energy. Is it going to happen quickly enough to make a difference in really reducing the impact of climate change here? Well, let me start by saying that we've known for a long time that a transition to 100% renewable energy is necessary. Um, you know, I can remember very clearly when I was in uh, elementary school, middle school, you know, learning about the problem of climate change, you know, learning that um, the cause was primarily our dependence on fossil fuels. I mean, I, I can't even tell you how many, you know, thousands of reams of paper have been devoted to all the, the studies and reports that have come out on this problem. And um, the good news is that um, more and more we can envision how to actually get there. You know, so not, not only is this transition to 100% renewable energy necessary, uh, but it is also feasible. And it, it's not, um, you know, a question of, um, you know, well, we'll get there 100 years from now, but really it, it, in the next couple of decades. Um, we have seen tremendous growth in clean energy technologies like solar um, and energy efficiency. We're starting to see um, electric vehicles really take off on, on our roads. Um, and we know that all the progress we've made to this point is, is just a tiny fraction of our overall potential. Um, just to highlight, you know, one, one resource that we have. So uh, Massachusetts has the highest offshore wind potential of any state in the country. Um, our offshore wind capacity, a potential capacity, is equivalent to uh, about 20 times our annual electricity usage. So the resources are out there. And um, the prices have come down dramatically, you know, 70, 80, even 90 percent for some of these technologies over the last decade. So, you know, when I look out at um, the future, you know, and, and what is what are the next couple of decades going to hold for Massachusetts? I mean, I think that there, there are a lot of reasons to be concerned. 
um, and maybe even alarmed, you know, by some of the potential impacts of, of climate change, um, you know, let alone the, the health consequences of, of burning this dirty energy and putting this pollution into our air every single day. Uh, but I also feel really hopeful. And, and I believe that uh, not only uh, must we get to a future powered by clean energy, but, but we can get there. And I think we're going to get there faster than, than any of us are expecting. Okay, it was nice to hear some optimism from you there on this start today. There's you know, a lot of follow-up questions for sure on, on what you were talking about there, especially on offshore wind. I mean, I think that that's going to be, um, I think there'll be a lot of questions today about that. And again, uh, if, uh, please type in your questions into the, the Q&A uh, tab there, and we'll, we'll be getting to them uh, really shortly. I, before we do, I, I just wanna ask one more question. Is just, I want, one of the other things uh, that you know we're talking a lot about, of course, is natural gas, right? I mean, most homes in Massachusetts are heated by natural gas. Um, one thing I was wondering about, something new this week, National Grid announced a plan to eliminate fossil fuels from its grid by 2050 and replace that by what they're calling renewable natural gas, which comes from decomposing organic matter. Uh, as well as green hydrogen, which is actually produced uh, by wind farms in, in part. Um, and I, you know, it sounds pretty good. Um, some environmental groups I know have come out uh, against this or at least been critical of the plan. What do you think of, of this announcement from National Grid and, and the idea that uh, they're going to stop using fossil fuels uh, in their existing natural gas infrastructure? Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing I'll say is that um, natural gas is, is natural in the same sense that arsenic is natural, right? So, um, you know, it, it, it's not good for us. And, um, you know, when, when we talk about our states dependent on, on, on gas, um, you know, we often talk about fossil gas because that, that's really what it is, right? It, it's a fossil fuel. Uh, you know, when we burn it, it, it puts climate altering pollution into our atmosphere. It, it harms our health, um, you know, uh, let alone actually it, in its unburned state, you know, when it uh, escapes from pipes and distribution systems in the form of leaks, uh, that, that can be even worse for our climate. So, um, you know, I'll say that uh, the, the need to um, transition our, our buildings, our, our homes and businesses off of fossil fuels is, is very apparent. Um, the energy that we use in our buildings is responsible for about 40% of our greenhouse gas emissions in Massachusetts. Um, most of that chunk comes from the oil and, and gas that we burn, uh, you know, mostly for heating, but also for hot water and, and for cooking as well. Um, and, you know, there's been this ongoing process in Massachusetts to investigate, um, you know, the, the future of gas, you know, the future of the gas utilities. And it, it, the bottom line is there is no future for gas. There is no future for the gas utilities, um, you know, at least not if they plan to, to remain gas utilities. And so, um, you know, National Grid, as you, as you mentioned, um, put out a plan recently, um, you know, essentially making the case that they're going to replace the, the fossil gas in their pipelines with um, you know, clean alternatives, you know, they call it renewable natural gas or, um, you know, hydrogen from renewable sources. And, and you know, I think that those, um, those fuels may have some role to play, uh, but they're probably not going to be, um, you know, piped throughout our neighborhoods into all of our homes. I mean, it, it's just, it's too expensive. Um, and the, the sources are not really abundant enough to provide sort of all, you know, all the energy that we would need for that purpose. So, um, I think that the most likely uh, future is that we're going to have to retire our gas distribution system in the next couple of decades and move to cleaner alternatives. Um, you know, some of that may um, involve a role for, for these companies that are currently gas utilities. You know, one idea that's been gaining some traction is um, the notion of having sort of networked uh, geothermal heating and cooling systems in our neighborhoods. So I, I think mm -hmm. that's a really promising idea that should be investigated. Um, but, you know, it, it may also just be individuals having, um, you know, clean technologies like air source heat pumps in their home. So, uh, you know, I think this national grid plan is, is a distraction. It's an effort to justify their continued relevance. And, and um, I hope our policymakers will be able to look beyond that towards, um, you know, the, the real solutions that our state needs. You know, one, one last follow up on that before. And there's already tons of great questions coming in. Thank you for those questions. Please keep them coming. We're going to get them. I just want to follow up real quickly on that because... In order to, to have the heat pumps, things like that, you know, I mean, my home is, is heated with natural gas, right? If my, if my natural gas based system failed tomorrow, or if I just wanted to replace it, you know, uh, proactively, um, that's an expensive prospect, right? And I, I, I'm just wondering about, you know, as we transition from that system, um, 
are, are we doing enough? Is the state doing enough? Is the federal government doing enough to encourage and to incentivize people to, to change their systems into other kinds of technologies that maybe would be more environmentally friendly? Yeah, you know, to be frank, I think this is gonna be one of the hardest aspects of, of solving climate change and, and eliminating our carbon pollution, um, you know, is, is the question of how do we get all of our all of our homes, you know, all of our businesses, all of our buildings in Massachusetts off of fossil fuels. And, um, you know, the, the state has set a target of getting to, you know, quote unquote, net zero greenhouse gas, gas emissions by 2050. You know, we would argue we should actually be doing that sooner and in fact, not being net zero, but actually just, you know, zero fossil fuel use across the board. Um, and, you know, that, that's gonna require, um, you know, in, in every, every home, essentially, uh, you know, replacing our oil and gas heating with a, a clean electric alternative like a heat pump. Um, and, and also doing energy efficiency upgrades along with that um, to make our buildings more uh, airtight and, and better insulated uh, to, to reduce the need for heating in the winter. So um, I'll say two things, you know, first is that um, we know that all of our heating systems are going to have to be replaced eventually, right? So, you know, if you install a, a new furnace, um, you know, the, the life on that is typically somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 years, right? So in a lot of cases, we're not talking about, you know, kind of going in tomorrow and saying, okay, everybody's got to rip out their heating system, you know, but it, it's like when it comes time to replace it, how do we make sure that folks are in a position to be able to replace it with a clean alternative, right? And, and that right. means um, education up front to make sure people know what their options are. It means um, working with all the installers, all the contractors to make sure that they're presenting those options to people. Um, and it also means, you know, having the, the incentives and, and the support in place. And I think that, that that's the second piece that's really important is that, you know, we need to help folks, uh, you know, make that transition. And um, there is some progress that's been made recently in terms of the state's um, energy efficiency programs, having more support uh, for folks to install heat pumps. But, um, but I, think that, I think there will be more that's needed on that front as well. Okay, great. Again, lots of great questions. So I'm going to jump right in there because we want to get through as many of these as we can. Um, a terrific question here. Uh, we don't have a name from this person, but they say you often hear people say lithium mining is much more environmentally damaging than drilling of oil. Uh, EVs are an environmental disaster. Um, even if that's true, a barrel of oil is burned, then you need a new one. Lithium, once mined, can be reused. How does this difference net out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll say that, um, you know, the, the question of the impact of renewable energy technologies is something that's been, you know, pretty um, extensively investigated. And, uh, you know, the, the sort of an earlier iteration of this question was like, well, you know, it, it takes a certain amount of, you know, um, energy, you know, often from fossil fuels to say manufacture a solar panel, you know, and so how does that kind of balance out to the energy that the solar panel produces over the course right. of its lifetime. And, yeah. you know, the, the findings on that is, is some, somewhere between a 90 to 95% um, gain, it, you know, in, in terms of the, the pollution reduction, you know, even assuming that the energy that is used to create that solar panel comes from fossil fuels. So, um, you know, so I, th I think it's an important thing to keep an eye on, but, um, you know, the, the overall um, impact of these clean technologies is, is a tremendous positive. Um, you know, we are, uh, you know, reducing tailpipe emissions, reducing the emissions from, from power plants, um, you know, that's having a, a real benefit to our air quality, to our public health, and, and of course, to our climate at the same time. Um, I think it's always important to look for ways that we can, you know, reduce even that kind of little bit of impact that, that remains. Um, you know, with, with battery technologies in particular, there's been, um, you know, tremendous advances in the last few years in um, batteries that, that need less lithium. Um, there are also alternative battery chemistries that are not um, lithium-based. So there's a a uh, startup in Somerville that's developed this really promising um, iron-based long-term energy storage technology. So I think I think we'll see more of those kinds of things come onto the market in the next few years. Um, you know, and then the other side of it is um, uh, recycling. So you know, making sure that you know once these uh, devices have reached the end of their lives, that we're able to recover and and um, reuse the the substances that are in there. And and um, the, the market for uh, recycling, you know, solar panels, for example, is much more advanced in in Europe because those technologies have been more extensively deployed there for longer. Uh, but I expect that as, you know, as we kind of reach that point in the US that that, that, that will happen as well. And, you know, there, there may be some um, sort of assistance needed from the government as well to, to get that up to scale. Okay, great. We, we have a question from John who says he's a student and he wants to do further research on this. He wants to know uh, who are some of the leading people with current studies on the economics concerning transitioning to clean energy. Uh, also, uh, he says much clean energy will be going uh, into the infrastructure. So 
Um, can, can you make some recommendations for, for John about uh, some of the people who are really uh, focusing on this issue? Well, I'd say one good place to start might be a report that we put out with our National Federation of Environment America um, maybe about a year ago uh, called We Have the Power, um, which summarizes sort of all, all of the research that's been done up to this point um, about the, the feasibility of 100% clean or 100% renewable energy systems. And um, there are, that report in turn uh, cites reports that have you know, collected um, you know, 100 or 150 or 200 different studies that have been conducted around the world. Um, you know, again, kind of demonstrating the feasibility of these systems. So I, th I think that, that that's sort of a good place to start. You know, certainly some of those um, studies it, it will, will definitely get at the, the financial aspects of it. Um, you know, and then um, beyond that, I think, um, you know, there's a number of um, advocacy groups that have done research, you know, kind of looking at the, um, you know, the clean energy grid, you know, what is, what is that going to cost, um, you know, both for, for New England as well as for um, the country as a whole. Uh, just last week, the actually I think it was earlier this week, the Union of Concerned Scientists released a report, um, sort of modeling a 100% clean uh, electric grid nationally, and, and again, kind of looking at some of these cost questions. So I think that that um, that can also be a helpful resource to understand some of these questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a question from Emily who says she heard on on GBH last night uh, the former head of Greenpeace speaking about uh, fossil fuel usage and saying that the world must end fossil fuel usage by 2030. Uh, that is just around the corner. Uh, Emily says, yikes. Uh, and I think that that's a fair assessment of it. Um, uh, I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say there's, uh, we're not going to end global fossil fuel usage by, by 2030. I, it just doesn't seem like that's going to happen. That, that's awfully close. But uh, uh, Emily wants to know um, how uh, the uh, public can convince governments to legislate and move on that. Um, and, and she cites that, that it's, the corporations are not going to do it. It's, it's up to the uh, to the government to, to act on that? And how can we, uh, she says, uh, convince governments to, to legislate? Well, you know, one thing I'll say is um, I expect we're going to see a lot of progress over the next decade. And, um, you know, I think that that progress will happen, as I said earlier, in, in many cases, you know, faster than we might think possible today. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we're, we're seeing more and more that these goals that, you know, at one point might have seemed kind of overly ambitious or pie in the sky um, are, are achievable. And, and, you know, just to give one example of that, um, actually just from earlier today. So um, the, the University of Massachusetts uh, Amherst uh, campus, the, the Commonwealth's flagship university, um, yeah, announced absolutely. a commitment to transition their entire campus off of fossil fuels uh, within the next 10 years. And, um, you know, keep in mind, I mean, UMass Amherst is really, uh, it's like a small city, you know, <laughs> so there's like 30,000 students, you know, plus however many faculty and staff. I mean, it, it's, you know, it's quite a sizable community. And um, they've laid out in, in quite a bit of detail, um, you know, how they're going to get their entire heating system in campus off, off of fossil fuels. You know, right now they're burning gas for that. Um, they're going to transition to, you know, primarily a geothermal based uh, uh, system. Um, also have their strategy for getting their electricity purchases to be all renewables. Um, you know, so I think uh, obviously that, you know, that's, that's one campus, you know, that, that's sort of one corner of the state. Um, but, you know, in itself, it, it's a pretty big deal. Um, and it's something that, you know, student activists, you know, particularly with uh, the, the Massburg Students Campus chapter out there, have been fighting for for a number of years. Um, and, I, you know, I think that we're going to see more and more um, institutions moving in this direction. I think we're going to see more and more businesses moving in this direction, you know, making commitments, again, that are not like with an end date of, you know, 2050, right? But, you know, really within, within the next few years. So, um, you know, so, so whatever we need to accomplish by 2030, like, even if it seems like unattainable, how are we ever going to do that? You know, is there the political will? Like, I think we just maintain a certain degree of optimism, you know, that like, if we kind of start moving in the right direction, take the steps, you know, today and tomorrow, um, you know, that, uh, you know, and really do everything we can in the short term, uh, you know, that, that will end up making even more progress than we had expected. Um, well, I mean, UMass okay. Amherst is one thing, right? But uh, I mean, her question really was about global need to end uh, uh, fossil fuels. And, and I guess, of course, you know, the United States uh, is not the only country that is, is producing uh, these, uh, you know, emissions. And, and I guess, how, what, what's your feeling about the, the global, the sense of the global effort and commitment to making the difference that needs to be made? Yeah, I mean, I think that this is one of the hardest parts of, of climate change, right, is that it, it is a global problem, and um, there's so much that we can do about it locally, and yet, 
in order to really, um, you know, protect our communities and have the, you know, the safe future that we and our children deserve. Like, we, you know, we need coordinated global action and, and, and that's really hard. Um, at the same time, I, I think that we are getting there in terms of the international will to act on this issue. And mm -hmm. I'll also say that um, what we do locally does matter, you know, and, and, you know, I think people sometimes feel like, oh, well, Ma Massachusetts, like, you know, we're, we're just a small state. We're only, you know, maybe 2% of the United States greenhouse gas emissions and U.S. obviously is just one country among many. Um, but, but what we do here does matter, you know, both in terms of reducing our impact, but even more so in terms of setting an example. And um, just, just to give kind of one illustration of that. So uh, back in um, around 1999, 2000, um, after years of advocacy by my organization, Environment Massachusetts and many others, um, Massachusetts adopted the first ever limits on carbon pollution from power plants. Um, this was a part of the campaign to, to clean up the filthy five, you know, five dirtiest power plants in the state. And, um, you know, similar policies were adopted in, in California. Um, you know, we saw other states gradually get on board with this idea of, you know, limiting carbon pollution. Um, once Barack Obama was elected president, the, the EPA started to move forward with national limits on carbon pollution from power plants. And um, all of that progress then gave President Obama, um, you know, some of the, the kind of political backing that he needed um, to negotiate, uh, you know, international climate agreements to, to bring mm -hmm. down pollution. So, um, you know, so I think it, it, it takes a while and, you know, we're not going to be able to do it on our own, but, um, but I do think what we do here really matters. And so, you know, every time, every time you can, you know, pick up the phone and call your state legislator, every time you can reply to one of our email alerts and, you know, kind of click the button to, you know, send a message to your state rep, like it, it, it does, it does add up to something bigger. Okay. All right. Um, question from Alan in Charlton says, are there plans to increase e-charging stations for cars in Massachusetts? Or will this be up to the private sector to move us forward? Uh, for example, uh, lack of working stations on the pike uh, seems like a state responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's certainly a big challenge in terms of um, you know getting electric vehicles to be a more widely adopted option. Um, I, I think that there is a lot of uh, consumer interest out there, and certainly you know the the available technology has improved quite a lot. The range mm -hmm. has improved. The prices come down. Um, but there, there is still that anxiety of like, you know, if, if I drive to, I don't know, visit my grandma an hour or two away, you know, am I going to be able to, to get back home on, on a single charge? And yeah. um, so I think having, having expanded charging infrastructure is really important. Um, and I do think that there is a role for um, the state to play in, in terms of coordinating that, uh, the expansion of that infrastructure. Um, and, and I think there's, there's two pieces of good news on that front. One is that in um, the bipartisan infrastructure bill that passed in Congress, Last at uh, the end towards the end of the last year, um, there is uh, uh, funding available um, to roll out uh, tens of thousands of EV charging stations across the country. So that's money that's going to be coming into um, you know Massachusetts as well as other states to make that happen. And um, secondly, that in a, a climate bill that was just passed by the Massachusetts Senate within the last couple of weeks, um, there were also provisions to expand EV charging and to have more uh, coordination in terms of where those are rolling out. Um, so I, I think both of those are really important steps in the right direction. Hopefully, um, you know, we'll, we'll give folks the confidence they need to really, um, you know, feel secure that they can get from point A to point B and back again in, in their electric cars. Okay, right. Um, you have a question um, about <clears throat> offshore windmills, um, asking, does the vibration of the offshore windmills affect the birds and fish or any underwater life? If yes, how much? And I, I think that's a great question because it, it actually gets to a lot of uh, concerns that environmentalists have about offshore wind, right? I mean, here's this, this intersection where you've got uh, people who, who are advocating for cleaner energy um, and concerns that maybe those alternatives might have their own costs. What do you think about that? Uh, do, you, do you know about the, the vibration that this, this uh, person's asking about? And, um, and, and other concerns about offshore wind. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, can't, I can't speak to the vibration issue in particular, um, but what I can say is that the impact of um, offshore wind projects on wildlife uh, ha has been extensively studied. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, particularly in the process of figuring out, you know, wh where are the first offshore wind farms gonna go in Massachusetts? You know, wh which areas are gonna be opened up for leasing? 
Um, and then in evaluating each individual project that's gone forward, you know, there's been an extensive environmental review process um, to take into account any potential impacts on wildlife and, and make sure that those are being uh, minimized. And, um, you know, a number of our uh, coalition partners that, um, you know, focus on wildlife issues um, have been at the table uh, negotiating with offshore wind companies and, and have supported uh, the projects that, that have come forward, um, including, you know, groups like Mass Audubon, um, you know, making sure that, that the impacts on, on birds and other wildlife are, are minimized. So, um, so I think it is, you know, it is an important thing, obviously, to keep an eye on. Um, you know, we're, we're really lucky in Massachusetts that we have a rich and diverse community of wildlife. And, you know, certainly it's, it's an important priority for my organization to make sure that, that those are, uh, you know, all of our species are being protected. Um, so I, I think we can do both. I think we can move forward with, you know, responsible clean energy development and also um, protect our biodiversity at the same time. Not to mention, of course, of course that the, the biggest threat to biodiversity today is climate change, right? So, you know, we've got we've to keep our eye on the solutions as well. Yeah, I mean, the, the fishing industry has had a lot of concerns about the offshore wind plants as well, uh, that it's, it's basically going to get in the way of, of that industry and, and make it hard and also take important fishing areas uh, offline that they can't access anymore. Um, you know, can you address that? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I'll say that, um, you know, again, I think that the, the impacts on wildlife, you know, whether it's fish, whether it's marine mammals, um, birds, you know, th that's been pretty extensively studied in the run-up to these uh, projects moving forward. And, and there are plans for, um, you know, continued monitoring going forward. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know that the, uh, some of the offshore wind developers like Vineyard Wind have, um, you know, put significant resources into trying to, um, you know, assist the, the fishing industry. Um, you know, so I, I, I think that, um, you know, th these things can coexist. And I'll just say again, um, you know, the, the biggest threat to, um, you know, not just a sustainable fishing industry, but like a sustainable population of fish in our oceans um, is, is a change in climate, right? You know, is, is you know, war warmer weather, uh, you know, um, changes in precipitation and storms, ocean acidification, you know, all these things undermine a healthy marine ecosystem. And so, um, you know, we, we have to do our part to solve that problem in Massachusetts. And then, um, you know, at the same time, obviously, you know, do that responsibly to, to minimize, um, you know, whatever direct impacts there might be. Okay. Um, we have a question here from Jean who asks, she says, in February, Ice New England decided to keep the MOPR rule, which I'll say it stands for the minimum offer price rule, that two more years of blocking, uh, for, for two, uh, that two more years blocking large amounts of solar rand wind power, uh, solar, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm reading it, Sarah, and solar and wind power till 2028 and giving subsidies for 2024 and 2025 of $12 million to a coal plant in New Hampshire. How do we stop these types of workarounds impacting the implementation of renewable energy solutions? I'm aware that FERC is voting on this. So right, so that's this issue. Let's talk about the minimum offer price rule, right? So uh, this, is, this is in front of FERC. First, can I, I can ask you to sort of define for everybody what the MOPR uh, means and, and, and what your thoughts are about that? Yeah, I'll, I'll do my best. I'll say that this is not an issue that my organization has been particularly focused okay. on. Um, but my understanding is that, so um, ISO New England, which is the organization that runs the um, electric grid for, for Massachusetts and the five other New England states, um, sets certain rules around the electricity market, um, which dictates you know, which types of generators are allowed to participate in different types of the market, at different parts of the market, and um, what sort of compensation do they receive for their energy. And so um, kind of in, indirectly, that can play a major role in, in determining, uh, you know, what types of uh, energy projects, you know, renewable or otherwise are, are financially feasible to move forward. And um, this particular rule um, excludes renewable generators from uh, participating in, in part of that market. Um, so therefore, you know, making it harder for them to compete and, and uh, in return, easier for these sort of legacy fossil fuel power plants to um, be compensated and, and some may say, you know, overcompensated or kind of over, overly taken into account, you know, relative to, to what we're actually going to need. Um, so I, I think it, it's, um, it's a good example of how uh, the transition to 100% renewable energy is something that is going to require uh, cooperation, you know, so, so there's a lot that we can do in Massachusetts, um, but we are in a regional electric grid. Um, yeah. And so the, the more that we can have all of the New England states moving together, I think that that's really helpful. The more we can have, you know, federal agencies like FERC, you know, kind of 
nudging things in the right direction. I think that that really helps as well. Um, you know, with ISO New England, I mean, the, the uh, governance structure is, is such that um, it, it's hard for kind of us as ordinary citizens to directly influence uh, the decisions that they make. But I think there are some signs that when the, the governors of the New England states speak together with one voice and say, like, this is actually these are, this is the direction our states going. Our states are going in is more renewable energy. These are the policies we need. Um, you know that uh, that that can have some impact. Um, you know whether it will be enough to change a specific decision. I think remains to be seen. But uh, but hopefully in the long term, you know that those sorts of voices will be heard. Okay, great. Uh, so many fantastic questions here. Thank you everybody for your questions and please keep them coming. We we have a lot uh, more to get to here. But I want to just take a quick moment. <clears throat> excuse me to introduce my colleague Sandy. Uh, hey Sandy. Hi, Craig. How are you? Thank you so much. And hello to everyone at home. I'm Sandy Chin with GVH's Member Engagement Department, and we're so glad you can join us today. And if you value GVH programs and events like this one, we ask you to please make a donation. Today, if you are able to give $5 a month as a GVH sustaining member or $60 all at once, we will send you things you can do on how to fight climate change and reduce waste. And written by award-winning climate journalist, Eduardo Garcia, and based on his popular New York Times column, One Thing You Can Do, this fully illustrated book offers a deeply researched and user-friendly guide to the things you can do every day to fight climate change. And to get your copy, there are three ways to give. Click on that link you see in the chat tab now, which takes you to gbh.org slash support events to make a donation. And if texting is easier, you can also text the letters GBH to 800-204-3811. Or go ahead and scan the QR code C here on the screen to open the secure donation form on your smartphone or device. Make your donation today and get access to inspiring ideas to reduce waste and carbon footprint in our daily lives. And with over 350 illustrations by talented painter, Sarah Bocatini Meadows, you'll learn more about how you can make that critical impact on climate change. Support lifelong learning and important conversations by giving to GBH now. And we're here for our community because of you. And we appreciate you being here for us with your support today. And if you're already a GBH member, we sincerely thank you for all you do. And now back to you, Craig, and more of your questions at home. Great, thanks so much, Sandy. And you know, uh, these are these are important topics. These are uh, issues that uh, we're going to be focusing on for a long time, and uh, we will be continuing to talk about them here in GBH. And we really appreciate all of your support uh, in in making it possible for us to have conversations like we're having today. Uh, tons more questions to get to. Ben, thank you again for this. I want to jump right back in with Barbara's question, who says, electric power is being hailed as a solution to many climate change problems. But what has to be done to make transmission of electricity more efficient and secure from attacks? Hmm. That's a really interesting question. I, I think that, um, you know, from the perspective of, um, like, you know, national security and, and terrorist attacks, I, I'd say that that's not my area of expertise, but um, I think that um, it is really important. And, um, you know, one, one thing that we can do to uh, increase the resilience of our communities and um, to reduce the impacts of interruptions, you know, whether those are from attacks or whether those are from, you know, uh, severe storms or other events that can cause, you know, major grid outages. Um, so one thing we can do to protect ourselves from all of that um, is to invest more in sources of renewable energy that are uh, closer to home, right? And so uh, when we can produce power in our communities, you know, for example, from rooftop solar panels, um, and when we have the ability to store that energy, you know, in the form of batteries or other types of energy storage, um, and then release it when it's needed, um, then we create the opportunity and the potential uh, to actually, you know, keep the lights on and, and to continue powering essential functions, uh, you know, even <laughs> Um, disruptions to, to the broader electric grid. And um, there are a number of communities that are already um, moving in this direction and, and sort of taking steps to increase this resilience. Um, we, we've highlighted in our, in our report, Renewable Communities, um, a couple of the municipalities that have um, 
municipally owned utility companies that mm -hmm. have invested in uh, solar plus battery storage. And um, so towns like, like Sterling and Ashburnham, um, in many cases, so these are kind of you know, north central Massachusetts for folks that don't have their uh, kind of Massachusetts map per perfectly memorized in their heads. Yeah. Um, so, you know, these are relatively small towns at Sterling, I think it has I don't know, maybe four or 5,000 people in it. And, um, but they've been able to, you know, invest in, in um, uh, you know, these facilities and, and um, it, it's connected to the um, sort of police dispatch emergency center. And so, you know, if and when there is a, you know, hurricane or something else that knocks out the broader electric grid, um, they'll be able to, to, you know, continue supplying power to that really important facility. So wow, um, I think great. that that's a really important, you know, benefit of renewable energy, um, you know, something that, um, you know, we know, we know a lot of people are motivated by, um, you know, climate change, by impacts of fossil fuels on public health. You know, for some people, it may, it may be more about national security. It may be more about, you know, kind of keeping our communities safe in, in times of disruption. And, um, you know, I think, I think all that's good. And I think that the more reasons we have to kind of um, you know, get folks moving in the same direction on renewables, the better. Okay, great. You know, you mentioned um, rooftop solar, and uh, we have a question about that from Jay, who says, uh, I installed solar panels 10 years ago. I recently added a heat pump to replace oil heating. He's doing quite a lot. Um, Jay says, if, if I go for the additional, for additional solar panels, what are the costs and incentives like now? That's a really good question. And I, um, I know that there are many people in Massachusetts who are, um, you know, the early adopters of solar energy, right, who, who sort of got on that bandwagon in the first few years as, as the solar incentives were first starting to roll out, um, you know, who are now looking at what else can they do, right? And, uh, you know, for many people, um, that does mean replacing their oil or gas heating with heat pumps. Um, it may also mean, you know, improving the energy efficiency of your home, you know, making the uh, the walls you know better insulated to to reduce the overall uh, demand for heat. You know, in addition to to switching the heat pumps at the same time, um, and I think that that's really great. And um, you know, one thing that has been standing in the way of um, people sort of taking that additional step is that um, in Massachusetts we have this uh, solar program, our, our most important solar program, called net metering. And um, what net metering is is basically if you have solar panels, you know, whether it's on the roof of your house or your business or, you know, over your parking lot or whatever, um, and you, you can provide that electricity back to the utility company, um, right. you know, at times when you're not using it in your own home and you'll get compensated for that electricity at the same rate as you do for the electricity that you use from the grid. Mm -hmm. So it allows you to essentially, if your panels produce enough electricity over the course of the year to cover your needs, you can end up with basically a you know zero or very low uh, electric bill. So that that's been kind of the bedrock of um, you know what's enabled solar to, to grow so rapidly in Massachusetts. And um, we have arbitrary limits on the amount of solar that is eligible for net metering in Massachusetts, which there's really no need for those limits, but the utility companies have insisted on uh, putting them in place. And um, there are certain exemptions to those limits for for projects that are below a certain size. Um, but the problem is that if you go from having solar panels on your home that are just powering your lights and your laptop and your iPhone and your toaster and whatever, to now also adding a heat pump and maybe electric vehicle charging, um, you may push the amount of solar that you need over that limit that is exempt from the net metering caps, right? So you could be in a situation where you're no longer eligible for this program, um, even though you're like doing all the right things, right? I mean, you're, you're doing exactly what you should be doing. Um, the good news is that the, the Senate um, in their, their climate bill that they adopted recently um, has included language that will help to address um, those limits. And so that I think will enable more people to, to do what, uh, what our commenter is, is looking at. Um, so I, you know, I'd encourage folks, but you know, hopefully that will pass by the end of the legislative session, July 31st. I would also encourage people, you know, just go out and talk to a solar company. You know, if, you know, if you don't know one, ask your neighbors who will put up solar panels. People love talking about their solar panels if they have solar panels. Um, you know, and, and I think there, there may be ways where even in the existing incentives, you could make it work. Um, but again, hopefully this legislation will, will make it easier for folks to do that. You, you talk about those early adopters. Uh, we have a question here from Ron, who uh, was, was at least trying to be one of those early adopters. Ron says, about 14 years ago, I studied using solar battery and ground source heat pumps to heat and cool my house with zero CO2 emissions, but it looked to be very expensive and time consuming to implement. So I didn't go that route. In 2022, the solar panels and batteries have improved a lot. Uh, how about ground source heat pump? Is, is this a viable alternative for my home at long last? 
Yeah, certainly the heat pump technology has come a long way in the last couple of decades. And, um, you know, to the point where uh, air source heat pumps um, are able to, you know, comfortably heat a home, um, you know, down to negative two degrees Fahrenheit, um, if not even below that. So, you know, the, the, it is really a technology that is um, mature and and ready for, you know, sort of the worst that the New England winters can throw it out. Yeah, it gets pretty bad. It gets, it gets colder than that. <laughs> Well, I'll say I, I went to college in Minnesota, and in Minnesota, there would be like several days each winter where the temperature never got, got above zero degrees Fahrenheit. So yeah. from that to Massachusetts, I'm like, oh, this is, this is easy. Like, it's all me here, easy. yeah. Yeah, but, um, but yeah, no, so we, we do have some tough weather here. It's, it's a challenge for sure. Um, the, the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center, which is a sort of quasi-public agency, um, has put out some really great resources for folks that are looking at making these improvements in their homes, you know, wh whether it's rooftop solar, whether it's heat pumps. Um, you know, insulation, energy efficiency, et cetera. And um, the, so if you go to masscec.com and um, the program, I, th I think is called Clean Energy Starts Here or Clean Energy at Home or something like that. Anyway, if, if you look at their website, you'll be able to find it. And they, they've got some really great resources, you know, a list of installers um, and, and sort of all the things you need to, to get started. And, and I think, um, you know, specifically to, to Ron's question, um, I would say most um, homeowners are looking at air source heat pumps um, you know, sort of a kind of cheaper option with, with less upfront costs and sort of less hassle to get it installed. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, for folks that have um, the resources to invest in, in a ground source or geothermal system um, who, you know, maybe have a slightly bigger property that can accommodate that, um, I think that that can also be a, a promising option and, and one that has um, ultimately lower operating costs, even if the upfront costs is a little bit higher. What about new construction? I mean, if, if you're building a new home or if developers are building new homes, do you think that that's something that's uh, like ground ground uh, systems might be more possible, might be economical to put in? Yeah, you know, that, that's certainly a possibility. And, um, you know, particularly if, uh, you know, sort of the, the building and the property can be designed in such a way as to, um, you know, maximize the, maximize the it, ground yeah. source potential and, and, you know, minimize the energy use. Um, I, th I think, again, this sort of idea of like um, neighborhood networked geothermal is, is kind of cool. And, you know, there, there's a couple of uh, uh, pilots that are moving forward in Massachusetts, um, you know, one of which is going to happen in the Merrimack Valley with some of the money that has um, come in from the, the settlement over the, the uh, gas explosion that happened a few years back. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that those are some really um, interesting projects and we should keep a close eye on them. And, and I think if that, um, you know, sort of ends up being viable, ends up being, you know, uh, cost effective, then um, it's definitely something we should look at, at rolling out more broadly. Okay, great. Um, I have a question from Michael that I'm so glad he asked because I've been wondering about this, is how can we make this transition without overburdening environmental justice communities who have experienced the negative impacts of fossil fuels and other extraction industries and are already facing the impacts of climate change? Um, a big question that I, th I know a lot of people are thinking about, but you know, can we make this transition without overburdening those communities that have already face the brunt of this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the first thing I'll say, I mean, so I, I think it's a really important question. And um, the first thing I'll say is that uh, there are some aspects of, of the clean energy transition um, that actually have no or very little additional costs or even, you know, will, will save people money pretty quickly. So there's a lot of things in the energy efficiency category that, that fit into that bucket. So if we can help people um, you know, again, obviously with state support, you know, and, and subsidies and incentives, if we can help people to have, um, you know, to retrofit their homes, you know, to retrofit multifamily, you know, to, to be more, more energy efficient, to require less energy for heating, to have better, better lighting fixtures, better plumbing, um, you know, these are changes that can actually result in, in more, more money in people's pockets, right? Um, so I, I think that that's um, an important thing to keep in mind and, and, you know, one place that I would start. Um, the other thing is to, uh, I think we should consider all the different ways that um, environmental justice communities can benefit from and can be included in the transition to renewable energy, right? And you know, so certainly, um, you know, reductions in pollution, reduct, you know, uh, improved health outcomes, you know, reduction in climate change, you know, all those are benefits that are felt by everybody in Massachusetts, and you know, particularly in folks that are in some of these neighborhoods that are often the most polluted, right? Um, but beyond that, you know, I think if there's opportunities to do um, like work, workforce development um, mm -hmm. and, and uh, training and, and help folks from, you know, communities that haven't always had access to these jobs to, to be able to work in the clean energy industry. I think that that can be really important. Um, there's been some really interesting work on uh, getting rooftop solar for um, like churches 
and other community organizations, you know, particularly in, in underserved communities um, as a way to enable those nonprofits to invest more in, yeah. in serving their communities. Um, you know, so I think, you know, and that, you know, enhanced incentives for rooftop solar in, in low-income communities. So there's kind of an additional, uh, you know, boost to, to some of the subsidies that are given. So I, I think any and all these things are, are really important strategies. And, um, you know, long story short, right, like we need to get our state to 100% renewable energy. We know that, you know, every day that we delay in making that transition, um, you know, harms our health and contributes to devastating climate change that's going to affect everybody in Massachusetts and, you know, particularly in some of these more vulnerable communities. And so we've got to do that quickly. And then let's, you know, also do it in a way that includes and, and brings as many folks as possible on board. We have some questions about solar and solar installations. First, um, this uh, person asks about, um, so this is a question about some of the large solar installations that are happening and being proposed around the state, uh, something that I've been wondering about as well. Some of us, she says, some of us, or he says, some of us are quite worried about destroying forests in order to build these installations. Also, in order to build the infrastructure for these installations, forests, wetlands, and other, other uh, underwater aquifers are threatened. I want to support solar power, and I want to know why it can't be done in a more widespread but smaller scale fashion, solar panels in as many locations as possible without destroying natural resources, even if this costs more. What are your thoughts on that? And I, I know, for example, that there's a, uh, an issue in the southeastern part of the state. There's a group called Save the Pine Barrens that's been, been concerned about trees being chopped down. I've done stories about in the western part of the state about forests uh, being proposed to be chopped down to, to put up solar installations. What, what, how do we handle that? What do you, what do you think of that? Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing I'll say is that we, we should certainly prioritize putting solar uh, in places that are already already developed, already impacted. So, um, you know, I think our, our roofs are the perfect place for it. Um, you know, I'd, I'd also look to um, parking lots, you know, to, to do parking lot canopies in as many places as possible. Um, you know, we've uh, done some research looking at the potential for um, putting solar on the roofs of, of big box stores across the mm -hmm. country, so stores like Walmart. And um, what we found is that the potential is actually enormous. So, um, you know, we could power, you know, literally millions of American homes um, just by putting solar panels on like Walmart and Target and, you know, Best Buy and whatever. Um, yeah, sure. So, you know, so I think that, that that's uh, definitely a really important piece of the, the, the puzzle. Um, I will say that I, I don't think that we're going to be able to meet all of our clean energy needs, um, you know, just with the sort of rooftop solar and parking lot canopy, um, in part because doing those projects is actually is, is significantly more expensive, right? So, so I think that that's kind of another um, sort of wrinkle that we need to keep in mind. So I, I think that we, we probably will need some amount of, you know, kind of larger ground mounted solar installations in order to meet our state's, you know, renewable energy transition. Um, and then, you know, the question is like, how, how do we locate those, um, you know, to minimize the impacts on ecosystems, on wildlife, on, on water quality? Um, so I think that all those questions are really important. And I, um, my hope is that you know the solar advocates and the industry and the folks that care about wildlife can sort of come to a table together and uh, figure out you know what what are and are not the right places and and there are some states like Maine for example where there has been um, sort of compromise that's been broadly supported in, in terms of solar land use um, so I don't, I don't know why we don't have that yet in Massachusetts but but I hope we will because I you know I, I would like to see everybody pushing in the same direction hmm. on this. Jeff asks. Uh, about hydrogen and its future here in the state and what's your thoughts on that? What do you think about the future of hydrogen here in Massachusetts? Yeah, I mean, I think it has the potential to play an important role uh, in terms of getting our state off of fossil fuels. And, um, you know, particularly uh, if we can generate the hydrogen using uh, renewable electricity. So um, there are multiple sources, multiple pathways to produce hydrogen. Um, some of which are good, you know, like uh, producing it from, from wind power and solar power, um, and some of which are really not good. So um, uh, you can create hydrogen from, from uh, methane gas, from fossil gas, um, and, you know, you have hydrogen, but you're also like releasing carbon into the atmosphere. So it's, it's like you're not really getting kind of a net um, environmental uh, benefit out of that. So, so I think that, that that's the first thing is to make sure that we're getting the hydrogen from, from good sources. And um, I see two primary applications for it. Um, the, the first is um, as a form of energy storage. So, um, you know, we can use uh, energy sources like wind and solar, you know, when, when they're most abundant, you know, when the sun's shining, when the wind's blowing uh, to produce hydrogen. 
and then uh, consume that hydrogen when there's less renewable energy on the grid as a way to offset some of those peaks and valleys. So that, that would be sort of one, one potential use. And then the other use would be that there, there's a set of um, uh, processes and, and sort of uh, uses of fossil fuels in our society that are just kind of harder um, to fix. So, um, you know, some of the examples that, you know, like um, long distance trucking, uh, you know, some like heavy industry applications where you need like a lot of heat um, or a lot of energy in a particular place at a particular time. Um, you know, so I think that those are places where, you know, hydrogen or some other type of, you know, synthetic fuel, or maybe some of this renewable natural gas that National Grid wants to gobble up for their distribution grid, you know, we should actually be using that instead for some of these industrial applications. So, um, you know, so I think that those are places where um, hydrogen definitely has a role to play. Um, and then again, I think it, I would just kind of caution that the, the sort of overly rosy picture that National Grid is painting where they're going to pump hydrogen into all of our homes. I don't think that that's ever going to happen. Um, but I do think that, you know, we, we will see some of these uses start to develop. Right. You know, one thing I wanted to ask about that we haven't touched on yet is, is hydropower, right? Is, you know, uh, we um, basically struck out with hydropower uh, a couple of times now in terms of um, trying to bring it from Maine and New Hampshire as the residents of the states uh, and, and regulators opposing those projects. Can you speak about the, the future of hydropower here? Yeah, I, I kind of feel like your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's been it's been a really um, a big push of the Baker administration for sure. And, you know, it is something that the legislature um, authorized, I think back in 2016. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been a real challenge for them to figure out uh, how to bring that power down from Canada. Um, you know, they run into several obstacles along the way with, with some of the different routes that they propose. Um, you know, I, I'd say for our part, I mean, you know, we are, um, we're not opposed to, you know, using some amount of large hydro in Massachusetts. And, and you know, I think that 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 resource may have a role to play in terms of uh, enabling our transition to a 100% clean electric grid. Um, at the same time, we should be mindful of the impacts. So, you know, certainly there are impacts sort of upstream, right? I mean, you know, in these places where the dams are, I mean, you know, there's, there's consequences for having a concrete wall in the middle of a river, right? I mean, you know, most cases these dams have already been built. So, you know, some of that is, is sort of, uh, you know, kind of old news in a way, but, but I think that that's important to, to keep in mind. And then, you know, and then also with the transmission routes as well to make sure that we're doing that in a, a way that is not um, kind of unnecessarily compromising our natural resources, you know, these really scenic places. So I, I think all that is um, important to keep in mind. You know, I, I, I expect they'll try again, um, but, you know, in terms of the, the timeline and the process, I think it's kind of anybody's guess at this point. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it hasn't been part of the, the argument against that been that by, devoting more effort to the hydropower, we should, we're we taking away what we should be focusing on here in Massachusetts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that is a concern for sure. And, um, you know, I think one, one proposal that has surfaced periodically over the years is like, you know, let, let's make hydro eligible for um, renewable energy incentives uh, in, in the same way that um, wind and solar are. And, and the, the yeah. problem is that, you know, as you said, that could end up uh, crowding out these local sources of renewables. And so I, I think that that is really important. You know, even if, even if they do figure out some way to get the hydro down here, um, you know, to, not to forget that like our, our, our fir the first place we look for energy in Massachusetts should be in our own backyard. And um, the more we can be harvesting the abundant wind resource off of our shores, the more we can be soaking up the abundant sunshine that shines down on our roofs pretty much every single day, um, you know, the more that we're actually creating the kind of future we want to see. A question from Deborah says, uh, we live in a town that has municipal electric company and they have rules in place that actually discourage residents from installing solar panels. Is there any way municipal electric companies can be inspired to change their tune on this? Yeah, you know, the, the municipal utilities have been sort of a, an interesting um, a kind of case study uh, over the last few years. So um, as folks may know, you know, there, there's about 50 or so cities and towns in Massachusetts where the electricity is provided, you know, not by Eversource or National Grid or Unitil, you know, these kind of big utility companies, but actually by um, utilities that are owned by, you know, the, the residents, by the, the municipalities uh, themselves, right? And, and so um, these companies are exempt from a lot of the um, state regulations that, that govern the larger utilities. And, and there's sort of pluses and minuses to that. So on the one hand, 
um, the municipal utilities can be a lot more uh, flexible, a lot more nimble in terms of mm -hmm. uh, trying out new things. You know, I mentioned Sterling and Ashburnham that have, um, you know, made these investments in energy storage. You know, that, that's, it, it's cool. I mean, they're sort of using their powers as municipal utility, um, you know, for, for good to, to try out some of these new technologies. Um, Concord is another example I'd highlight. Actually, you know, Concord has come out with some, you know, pretty amazing programs to um, encourage solar and to really like envision how to, you know, how do we get solar on every possible surface, every possible place we can get it in our community. So I think mm -hmm. there, there's some really good examples out there. Um, there's also municipal utilities that are really lagging behind. And um, I would say that the, you know, fortunately, um, municipal utilities are accountable to the residents of their towns, right? So there are different governance structures in place, but ultimately they answer either to the voters or to the select board or some other, you know, municipal authority. And so um, I think if your utility is not supporting clean energy in the way that you'd like them to, um, you know, there, there are some, there is some recourse there, right? Um, that, you know, some ways you can apply pressure. And um, one of our coalition partners, uh, Massachusetts Climate Action Network, has actually put out some really great resources um, in terms of getting municipal utilities to do more for renewables. And so I certainly would encourage residents of those communities to, to take a look at that if they haven't already. Susan would like your thoughts on fusion and, and what we're thinking about fusion as, as a, a future of clean energy here in Massachusetts. She knows that, that um, MIT has been working on that. What, what are your thoughts about fusion? Yeah, I, I think it's a cool idea if they can ever make it work. Um, I, I think it's one of those things that, uh, you know, is sort of perpetually 10 or 20 years in the future. <laughs> so, um, yeah. you know, I'm sure if we like look back at, you know, WGBH newscasts from the 70s or 80s, you know, you would have heard experts saying like, oh yeah, by, by 1980, by 1990, we'll have fusion plants operating all across the country. And, you know, here we are in 2022 and it's not happened yet. Um, that's not to say it won't happen, right? I, I think that um, you know, having, you know, brilliant minds at MIT and other institutions continue to investigate it is really important. Um, I think that there are some formidable uh, um, obstacles, you know, of, of physics that sort of stand in the way of, of realizing it. But I think if those can be overcome, um, that would be great. And then, you know, in the meantime, let's continue to invest in the proven technologies that are available to us today, like wind and solar, which we know can power Massachusetts many times over. Yeah. We have another question about uh, EVs and uh, range anxiety from John, who says uh, EV manufacturers are uh, recently offering reductions in range anxiety with reported 500 plus miles per charge. Significant cost to this approach and a relatively small proportion of consumers that actually need more than two to 300 miles on charge just as they currently get from a tank of gas. Uh, he says charger ubiquity like gas stations ubiquity. Uh, versus doubling of range? What, what do you see winning out there? <laughs> um, that's a really good question. I mean, I, I sort of, um, uh, I don't know. Can I, I'm going to pick a third option, which is, I, so we absolutely need EVs and like, mm -hmm. let's get as many of them on the road as quickly as we can. Um, but also I hope in the next 10 or 20 years that we see a major reduction in the amount of driving that we're doing. Um, you know, we know that there, there is an impact. I mean, as we've talked about earlier, right? There is an impact to manufacturing these vehicles. There is, you know, an impact to the electricity that charges them. I mean, more and more of that is going to come from renewables, but, you know, we still have to build all these solar panels and all these wind turbines, right? So, you know, it's like with anything, like we want to use less energy first and prioritize that. And some of the ways we can do that for our transportation sector include walking, biking, um, public transit. Um, the advocacy group Transit Matters has put out this really amazing vision for like a regional rail system where, you know, if you lived in a town like Salem, you could get to downtown Boston in 25 minutes and the trains would run every 15 minutes throughout most of the day. And like, that would be, like, that'd be so cool. You know, so that, those are the sorts of things that could really, I think, get people um, out of their vehicles and onto the train. So, so anyway, so, you know, we'll have better cars, we'll have more charging, but we really have to like invest in transit walking and biking too. Cause like, we just, you know, as a society, we don't need to be driving as much as we are. And the more we can tackle that problem, the easier all the mm -hmm. rest of this is going to be to solve. Okay. Uh, time just for one last question. Deborah asks, uh, what type of clean energy is the most efficient, makes the most energy with the lowest amount of time, effort, and cost? I mean, I think my answer would have to be energy efficiency. And, um, you know, it's like the, the cleanest energy we can use is the energy that we never use in the first place. Um, and it, it's really uh, startling to realize, like, how, how much energy we're wasting as a society. So, um, the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy did an analysis a couple of years ago, and they found that we could reduce our energy use by 50% by the year 2050 nationwide um, through 
efficiency and through conservation, right? So basically like we're using like twice as much energy as we even need. Yeah. And um, just one example recently of how we've moved forward on this is um, last year, uh, legislation that Environment Massachusetts and other groups campaigned for um, was signed into law that will uh, make our appliances more energy efficient. And, um, you know, that uh, relatively small action is actually going to uh, reduce our carbon emissions by the equivalent of taking about 35,000 cars off the road uh, by the year 2035. So, you know, the more, the more we look around, the more we see opportunities like this and like, yeah, like we need to build a ton of solar, a ton of wind, but like, first and foremost, let's just like, let's cut out the waste. Like, <laughs> let's, let's figure out how to use less um, and live better lives. And like, I think that that, that's the, like, that's the message we should all take away on Earth Day, right? It's like, let's, you know, reduce our impact. Um, and, and there's so many ways we can do that. Great. Well, this is, is so much to talk about. Uh, I wish we had more time. We, we've, uh, we've run through all of our time and there's so many more great questions that people have asked here and so much more that we could talk about, but we've gotten to a lot. And Ben, I'm so grateful uh, that you've taken the time to, to answer all of these questions and, and to be with us today. And, and, um, and, and thanks for all answering all my questions over the years that we've been talking, uh, I know we're not done. There's a lot of important environmental issues that Massachusetts is facing and we'll be talking more in the future. Uh, so thank you for joining us. I also wanna thank everybody else who's, who's tuned in for this conversation today. Uh, it's so great to hear from your questions and that people are, are so excited and interested in, in these issues. Um, please join us for more of these events. Uh, actually coming up on uh, May 22nd, World Bee Day, we have another Ask the Expert event all about honeybees, so come back and join us for that. But thank you everybody who's uh, joined us today um, and, and tune in for, for more events like this. Thanks again and, and happy Earth Day everybody.